astounding facts. Um, one, she realized that we were eating much too high on the food chain, and this was causing an, an environmental disaster around the world. Um, at that time, a lot of uh, rainforests were being cut down to provide pasture, grass fed beef, um, which was then sold to McDonald's. And that's where McDonald's got its cheap meat, basically, to uh, become the hamburger center of the world. Um, and then she also discovered that even though there were 650 million hungry people at the time, that the world produced one and a half enough times enough food for every man, woman, and child on the planet. So there was a superabundance of food, and yet all these people were going hungry. Um, and she noticed that who was going hungry? She noticed it wasn't the rich, it was the poor. So the people were going hungry not because there wasn't enough food, but because they were too poor to buy the food that was being produced. And this was actually revolutionary at the time because we had people like Alan Toffler and Future Shock, and uh, we had this uh, Garrett Hardin with his tragedy of the commons, and everything was about, the problem was overpopulation and scarcity. The key word was scarcity. People were going hungry because food was scarce, and we had to double food production within the next generation, or the world was gonna starve. We were gonna eat ourselves off the planet. Um, and of course, what she found completely contradicted this. So anyway, her, food, her book became very popular, and with the royalties from the book, she established Food First. Mm. And as she continued to, uh, as Food First then continued to research this issue, we realized that we, of course, then had to ask, why are so many people poor? Is it just a lack of development? Is it underdevelopment? And that pretty much was the trope at the time. These were the development decades, and the global north was going to provide the technological expertise so that the south could develop, and they would end hunger, and they would catch up with the north economically. Um, and there was a, Gene Rostow had a whole, Rostow had a whole uh, theory of the 10 stages of development taking off. It was really seen as kind of an evolution. Everybody was soon going to be, in fact, within 10 years, they had a development decade, and they said within 10 years, everybody was going to be as rich as the United States, as well off as the United States, as well fed as the United States. You know. um, and this unleashed you know, a huge uh, development industry. Um, but as Food First did more research into the causes of hunger, realized that who were these poor people? And it turns out that many of them were farmers. And it turns out that they were producing most of the world's food. Now this is true 40 years ago. It just happens to be true again today. Um, and what's especially disturbing is that this is not only true far away, once upon a time in a country far away, no. This is true today and it's true in this country as well. One in seven people in this country are going hungry. We call them food insecure. That's the same as the number of people who are going hungry around the world. So that's not a very good record for the richest country in the world that produces more food than anybody else except China. What I want to talk about today is how to turn that around. How do we transform this food system? And I would like to advance the idea that the way we do it from here in the United States is by working with the food justice movement. And that key to transforming the food system with the food justice movement is dismantling racism. Not just in the food system, but dismantling racism in the food movement. And I think these two I think these two things are inextricably connected. In other words, I don't think that we can feed everyone in this country decently 
with healthy food if we don't dismantle racism in the food system. And I don't think that we can dismantle racism in the food system if we don't transform it. So, the first thing I think we ought to do is congratulate ourselves because we have a vibrant food movement. So, how many people here shop at farmer's markets? I know this is a select crowd, <laughs> but that's all right. How many grow organic food? Buy organic food? Great. CSAs? Anybody belong to a CSA food hub? Okay. School garden program? Yes, sir. Urban farm? Okay. That's great. You know, I left this country in 76, and I didn't really come back until 96. I was working in Latin America, as um, Hillary mentioned. So when I came back, I was really, when I left, I grew up on farms as a farm worker. And what I remember, was the United Farm Workers Organization, the UFW, in California. So that's what I remember about, remembered about food and, and justice. But then when I came back here in 1996, all of a sudden, here's this food movement, this great, big, widespread, diverse food movement. And, there's, and within the food movement, you're talking about good food, local food, organic food, aren't I? and some people are talking about food justice. And then I began to learn about, in the abundance of all this food, how some people had to eat the bad food and were getting sick. Right? So I thought this was all very exciting. And it is extremely exciting. You know, our attention to food is really something new. And it's kind of, for me, it was very strange. Because I'd come from places where sometimes there really was a scarcity of food. And yeah, people talked about food. But here there was an abundance of food, and then you know, everybody's still talking about it. Why is everybody so interested in food? I think it's a good interest, especially if it's about good, healthy food and access to good, healthy food. But I think if we're as concerned about people as we are about food, we have to ask ourselves some hard questions. Like we have to ask, how come one in seven people go hungry in this country? 50 million people, 14%, over 14, almost 15% of our population is food insecure. And we have to ask, why is it that the people who are most food insecure are people of color? Why is it that the people who are most food insecure are the immigrants who grow, harvest, process, cook, and serve our food? Why is it that people of color and workers in the food system are the ones that suffer the highest rates of diet-related disease because of the food that they eat? I mentioned that world hunger now is at the worst it's ever been. There's over a billion people going hungry, most of whom are in Asia and the Pacific. Um, and this is happening at a time when we've never grown as much food in the history of the planet. If you look back over the last 50 years, but just looking back to 1990 in this graph, what we see is that food production per capita has grown by about 12% a year worldwide. That means that every single one of us, each year we're supposed to get 12% more food. And yet we have a billion hungry people and 50 million hungry people in this country. If you look at those blue diamonds up there, that's absolute poverty. You see, the poverty hasn't changed. Even though we're producing more food, poverty has not changed. And if you look at the yellow dots, that's undernourishment. Undernourishment hasn't changed. So clearly, 
solving the problem of hunger and undernourishment doesn't have anything to do with scarcity. We're producing more than enough food. It's not about production. And yet this is what you hear every day in the papers. This is what you hear at the UN. This is what you hear at the USDA. This is what you hear at US, with USAID. That we've got a double production by 2050 to feed 10 billion people or we're all going to starve. Well, first of all, we already feed, we already produce enough food today to feed 10 billion people. And second of all, if anybody's, it's not everybody's going to starve when people starve. We already know that. It's the poor who starve. And tragically, those who are the most hungry are the farmers, the ones producing our food. And among those farmers, 70% of the world's hungry are farmers. And most of those farmers are women. Women produce most of the world's food, and women and girls are the ones who are going hungry around the world. This is clearly an injustice. This is not just a mistake. This isn't a problem of infrastructure. It's not a problem of lack of technology. It's not a problem of um, distribution. It's not even a problem of waste, even though we waste 40% of our food. If we look back over the last century, this is the price of food worldwide. It's called the Food Price Index. We started um, covering this, we started uh, producing the Food Price Index, generating the Food Price Index in 1900. And what we see is that food, the price of food on the global market has been going down steadily ever since 1900. Now you have a few spikes there from the wars, from the oil crisis, but basically it's beginning cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Why? Because we've been overproducing it. And it brings down the price on the world market. Until 2008. And then we get the food price spike. And the price of food goes off, literally off the charts. We've never seen such high prices since we started recording the price of food globally in 2008. And what happened? Here's the graphs again. 2008, the price of food goes up. Don't worry about the blue and black. One's constant, one's current prices. But they're basically, they have the same pattern. So we have low prices in 2004. These are historic. And then in 2008, it jumps off the charts. It drops back down, it jumps up again in 2011. Now, if this chart was to continue, it would do the same thing. It would drop back down again and jump up again. We have tremendous volatility in the, in the, in the food prices around the world today. Those red lines, those are food riots. So what you can see is that people riot around the world. When the food price index gets close to 200, there's a threshold. And when that price goes over that threshold, people take to the streets. Now, in 2008, we saw a lot of riots. There were over 100 riots. Many people were killed. But at Food First, we stopped calling them riots. And I'll tell you why. Because you saw riots in Places which you, where you might expect them, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in the Caribbean, in Haiti, where people were subsisting on mud biscuits. You know mud biscuits? You take some lard, you take some clay, bake that. They, they were used medicinally. They were used as nutritional supplements um, for women, who, pregnant women. You just, they're little. You eat them. They're a special clay. It's not any kind of clay. Right? But people started eating those instead of food because they couldn't afford the food. And so when the food prices go up, they couldn't eat anything. And so they rioted. But when they rioted, they didn't storm the warehouses where the rice was kept. You know, the U.S. ships rice to Haiti, a gift to the people of the United States. It's from USAID. It's called Miami Rice. They shipped so much rice to Haiti, put all the rice farmers in Haiti out of business. But anyway, the, the rice is kept in these warehouses. They didn't storm the warehouses, break the, rock, the locks and get at the rice. They stormed the National Palace. They drove the Prime Minister out of office, out of the country. 
Why? Because they were protesting against an unjust food system, an unjust political system, which couldn't solve the very simple problem. Here is the food, here's the hungry people, let's just put them together. And why didn't the Prime Minister do that? Because that food which we give to Haiti is supposed to be sold to the people of Haiti. It's not supposed to be given away. It's supposed to be sold. And they're bound by contract with, the US, with USAID to sell that food. And so people were starving, and they, didn't, they couldn't sell the food. And they couldn't give the food away. And that's why people riot, because that is an injustice. The second spike there, see all those red lines all clumped up like that? That's the Arab Spring. So, in every single case of the revolutions during the Arab Spring, they started with a food riot. Now this gets leaders thinking. You know, this is bad. And in fact, this might even be bad for business. Who knows? But it's certainly bad for political stability. And so, the G8 met, the, the WHO met, the United Nations met, the FAO met. They all met to figure out what are we going to do. I'm not actually going to talk about that because I don't think they did anything. <laughs> but the important thing to notice about these food <clears throat> riots and these price spikes, and we, and we just had another one, is that they always correspond to record harvests. So whenever we have record harvests, people go hungry. And we have record profits by the corporations who control the global food system. So these are the big monopolies, the oligopolies, the giants, like Archer Daniels Midlands Grain Company, Cargill, huge grain company, Monsanto, big input company, Seeds, um, and then the retailers, the big retailers, Walmart, Carrefour, Tesco, Safeway, all of these companies made record profits when a billion people were going hungry. You know, they asked them, somebody asked, I think it was um, Monsanto, about these profits. Don't you feel, you know, a little bad making all these profits when so many people are going hungry? And the CEO said, oh, don't ask us about the profits that we make. Ask us what we do with the profits. But what do you do with profits? We reinvest. So the red line, there again, we have the 2008 spike, goes up, goes down, goes up again in 2011. Those, that's the food price index. That's what you buy food for in the world market. The blue line, that's what you buy food for in the store. That's the local food price index, the retail index. So what you can see is that the grain companies make their money when the red line goes up. But the giant supermarkets make their money not just when the blue line goes up, the blue line doesn't drop back down. So when the price goes down on the world market, they keep their prices high. They don't drop them down. Basically, they gouge us. And that's where they make their money. Oh, the other graph looks just like the first graph. That's Monsanto's stock price. So Monsanto's stock price goes up as people go hungry. When people start to be able to eat again, because the price is going down on the world market, Monsanto's stock price goes down. That means the shareholders sell their shares. Now this creates a terrible problem for Monsanto, because Monsanto has accumulated all this money. They need to reinvest it. And right what they want to reinvest Everybody's pulling their stocks out. So what does Monsanto need? They need another food crisis. And they got one. I'm not saying that they planned it. Other people have said that, though. <laughs> so I think what's important to understand here is the logic behind this food system. It's not a logic of food. 
It's a logic of commodities. It's a logic of capital. It's a logic of accumulation and finance. So when all of these companies made these windfall profits with the food crisis, all of a sudden they have all this cash. And they've got to reinvest that cash. Because if they don't, their stock price is going to go down. This is what happened with Monsanto. You've got to reinvest. You've got to keep growing. So they need either another crisis or they've got to go save somebody from hunger. So that's when you have the New Green Revolution and Bill Gates and everybody saying, well, we're going to save Africa from hunger. Right? Because they've got to reinvest their profits. And there's no place to reinvest here. We're in a recession. Markets are saturated. So they've got to open up new markets, which means they have to destroy other ones. So what you see happening in Africa today is that they're destroying local markets, destroying local production, so that these companies can come in and save people from hunger. So they, you have to create the hungry people first, and then you can save them. Now, how does this connect to the United States? Basically, what we see here is the rise of what we call the food regimes. And if you think about the first food regime, a food regime is all of the institutions and all of the rules which control our global food system. So the first food regimes were colonial food regimes. They came out of Europe as the, as, as the empires conquered and established colonies in Africa and in the Americas and in Asia. And it is this through military dispossession. And then in this country, and through enslavement and genocide. That's how they conquered these lands. And then what happens was these lands provided cheap raw materials and cheap food so that the North could industrialize. And that was true in Europe, and that was true in this country. This country was able to industrialize because of the slavery and the tremendous mega profits from cotton in the South. Europe was able to industrialize because it colonized Africa and, and um, Latin America and Asia. Then agriculture itself is industrialized in the global north. And that does two things. It shoves people off the land and requires the importation of labor, of immigrant labor, for this industrial, what became the industrial food system. At one time in this country, we had something like, um, if I can remember, there were, 80% of the industrial, of the agricultural workforce in this country uh, in the late 1800s was Chinese. We imported them. And then we get to World War II and everything begins to change. Because after the war, the flow of food is reversed. The US and Europe begin to overproduce food. And so they have to send it to the global south but the Global South is already producing this food. So they'd have to destroy the food systems in the Global South to get them to buy the food from the North. And they did that through the Green Revolution. That was the first stage. So the Green Revolution is the transfer of the industrial model of food production in the North to the Global South. And that happened because Ford and John Deere and, and the seed companies, and basically Ford and Rockefeller, had already saturated the markets here in the north. The farmers couldn't buy any more tractors. They couldn't buy any more seeds. They couldn't buy any more fertilizer. Same thing happened in Europe. So where's it going to go? Well, let's sell it to the global south. Well, one, they've already got their own food. And two, they don't have any money. So we loaned them the money to buy our goods and destroyed their local food systems. 
completely industrialized it in the global south as well. So what that does then is it creates tremendous dispossession and we get waves of immigrants coming to the north looking for work because you destroy their livelihoods. And now the face of immigrant labor in, in agriculture in the United States is all people of color. In the, in the west, in the southwest, and all through the Midwest, it's largely Mexican and Central American labor. On the East Coast, there's more people from the Caribbean, but still largely Mexican labor. And these folks are former farmers whose livelihoods have been destroyed. The next step in, in this were the free trade agreements. And the free trade agree the free structural adjustment in the free trade agreements. So we'd loaned all the money so they could buy all our machinery and all our hybrid seeds and all our fertilizer. Everybody starts producing down there, and we start producing up here too. I don't know if anybody remembers the 70s. But in the 70s, farmers were told the world is starving. The American farmer is the most productive farmer in the history of the world. Plant fence row to fence row. Here's the money, we're gonna loan it to you. Buy new machines. In fact, tear out the fence row, buy your neighbor's property. So farmers here began to produce, and began to buy property, and began to shove each other out of agriculture. And then, just when the global north was producing all this food, the global south was producing all this food, the price of food drops down to nothing, everybody goes broke. We lost half of our farmers in this country. We went from 4% to 2% of the population. The bank forecloses on all these farms, but the countries in the global south can't pay back their loans either. These are loans to private banks on Wall Street. Can't pay back their loans. Why? Because there's no price in the products that they're producing anymore. Well, you can't foreclose on Brazil. You can't foreclose on Mexico. You can't foreclose on India. So what do we do? We basically did the structural adjustment policies in the 80s and 90s. And this is where we get what's called the corporate food regime, today's food regime. So the World Bank comes in and loans these countries the money to pay back, to maintain their payments to northern private banks. So I don't know if you know this, but the World Bank is a public bank. That's our money. That's our tax dollars and the tax dollars of the other contributors, the G8 countries. So you take public money, loan it to countries to pay back private banks. This is an old story. But to do that, to get that money, you had to sign with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Otherwise, the World Bank would not give you any money. And the International Monetary Fund said, okay, what you have to do is you have to dismantle your public sector, sell off all your public goods, You've got to devaluate your currency. Stop growing food. We've got all the food you need in the north. You just buy it from us. Grow luxury crops. Grow flowers. Sell them on the international market. Get dollars to pay back your loans. So what happens here is you get a tremendous movement of people of color from the global south coming to the north looking for work. And it just reproduces a pattern which has been happening for hundreds of years, where the global food system is built on the backs of people of color and, and built through dispossession and exploitation. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see the rise in contradictions and in violence, and particularly in police violence, in communities of color because of all the pressures that we're putting on these communities, and because our police forces have been militarized, because the extra military hardware from the wars that we're fighting are not, have now been passed on to the police force. Actually, I just talked about all of these things, but the results have been devastating. And so, at the same time, we have a rise in diet-related diseases in the United States. We have all these other impacts from the global food regime, the loss of our crop diversity, greenhouse gas emissions, 20% are produced by industrial agriculture, the largest single contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. 
uses up 80% of the world's water. Um, land is being grabbed all over the place because there's all this cash sloshing around the world. They don't know what to do with it, so they're buying land with it. All that, in the cities, it looks like gentrification. That's why it's so hard to get land. That's why it's so hard to find a place to grow in the city. Because now there's all this pressure on it. All this money coming in, buying up that land. It's the same process. And we see an increase of inequality around the world. An increase of racism around the world. And we see a horrible, terrible, tragic loss of the public sphere. Now what do I mean by that? We used to share a lot more. Just think about the PTA. Think about public education and the PTA. The PTA was the public sphere which managed our public good, which was called education. That's where we came together. We had to deal with each other, and we made decisions based on what was best for everybody. That is being lost. As we lose our public services, as our education, our health, education, and welfare is privatized. The other big loss is our public sphere, our community organizations. This is happening around the world. I can tell you for sure because I, because it's food first, I travel around the world. I talk to groups like you everywhere. It's happening everywhere. And this is tragic because right at the time when we have to face climate change, a rise in diet-related disease, a rise in police violence, a, a rise in hunger is precisely the time when our public sphere, that, that place that used to protect us, where we stuck together in, in mutual protection, has been eroded. So to recover control over our food system and make it a food system which is healthy and sustainable and equitable, we need to recover our public sphere. And what's keeping us from doing that? I think that what is most keeping us from doing that in this country is racism. That's what's keeping us apart. And what might help us come back together, that one thing that could help us come back together and begin to recapture the public sphere is dismantling racism. And the one place that I see the public sphere being reconstructed is in the food movement and in the food justice movement. Think about what you have to do to put in a garden. Think about what you have to do to put in an urban farm, start a CSA, establish a farmer's market. All the work, all the relationships, all the negotiation, all the cooperation, that is the public sphere. So the one hopeful light that I see in all of this is in fact the work which all of you are doing. Or most of you are doing. I know some of you are just busy trying to get through school. It's not easy to do. If it was easy, we would have already done it. This is just a kind of a tragic cartoon. Things have gotten so bad. Inequality has gotten so bad. Economic inequality has gotten so bad that 85 people, now this is only 80. This was last year. This year it's 80. 80 people own half of the world's wealth. Well, this time of economic inequality, of course, only exacerbates racial inequality. Because the externalities, those things which the companies pass off, the social and the environmental externalities, they keep the profits, they pass off the externalities, those always fall hardest on underserved communities and people of color. So, I've already spoken about the loss of the public sphere, how it affects us, and why we need to rebuild the public sphere. In the global south, you see the rise of a movement for food sovereignty. This is largely peasant-based. And they're calling for taking back the food system, not just the land, taking back the food system, democratizing the food system in favor of the poor, the right to food, 
the right to grow food, the right to determine what food you're going to grow, the right not to get clobbered in the market by the monopolies. In the United States, what we see first is the rise of food assistance because it's so bad. Things are so bad. This is what uh, the Black Panthers used to call um, survival pending revolution. First you gotta survive. Then you have to think about changing things. So the first thing we've done here is to try to survive. And people avail themselves of all these different government programs, of the food pantries, of the food banks. The food banks were supposed to be a temporary thing. They become a permanent thing. So we also see Another part in our food movement, which says that the food movement's broken, and what you have to do is vote with your fork. You have to send a message through the market, letting the market know that what you want to do is eat locally and eat organic and eat healthy, and that's great if you have the money to vote with your fork. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of neighborhoods, if we're voting with our fork, there aren't any polling stations. And I would say this isn't a broken food system. This food system is working exactly as, it, as the way it's always worked. And it serves some interests very well. So I don't think we can fix it. I think we really have to transform it. And so it's good to eat local. It's good to eat according to your values if you can. You should. But it's not enough to transform the food system. So this is why I think that the food justice movement is pivotal for the transformation of the food system, because it's based on justice. And if you look at the roots of the food justice movement, you see that anyone who is in the food justice movement comes from some movement for justice. And I think that's what makes it strong. It is a movement of movements. But I think we also have to admit that if there's racism in the food system, and there's racism in the food movement, there's also racism in the food justice movement. And it's inescapable. Of course there has to be. It reflects the structures around us. Why am I speaking to you today? Why isn't it a young woman of color? It's because of the structural injustice in our society. It's because of structural racism in our society. We have to dismantle this. We have to figure out a way to deal with white privilege and dismantle white privilege. Otherwise we can't dismantle oppression. And I don't look it, but I'm half Puerto Rican. And so I also know a little about a, a bit about internalized oppression. I had my language taken away when I was a boy. It was really hard to get it back. It took me decades to get it back. That's called language oppression. And for a long time, I felt like that language wasn't worthy. That's internalized oppression. So we have to deal with internalized oppression as well. Because we need to create a powerful alliance within the food justice movement. Otherwise, we can't change the system. We can't create political will. There's some historical precedents for all of this. The Black Panther Party started the free, breast, free breakfast uh, program for children. There was no free breakfast for children before the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers relied upon their own community for this food. They didn't take a penny from government. <laughs> they wouldn't have gotten it. They didn't take a penny from philanthropy. Philanthropy wasn't around. Now, things were different back then. There were many more black-owned businesses in the inner cities that could support this kind of a movement. Many of those communities have been economically destroyed over the last 50 years, along with the destruction of the economies of the global south, and you know, of the food systems of the global south. The economies of our inner cities and our communities of color have also been destroyed. So now it's a little bit more difficult to do that, but 
the essence of it, I think, is very powerful because the Panthers basically said, we can feed ourselves. That is food sovereignty. We're going to take back control of our own food. That is food sovereignty. And they said something else which I think the food movement really needs to learn, which is food is just one plank in a larger platform for liberation. Because they said we want food, we want jobs, we want education, we want an end to police brutality. We want health. We want health, education, and welfare. These are rights. And food was one of those rights. So as we work to transform the food system, I have to realize that this is part of everything else. And if we can work to transform the food system, it's going to affect all other parts of our food system. So the food system is pivotal. Ending injustice in the food system is pivotal. And dismantling racism in the food system and the food movement is also pivotal. Because if we don't, we can't have a powerful food movement. And we need a powerful food movement or we can't have these changes. I'm actually winding up, winding down. So we talked about the corporate food regime. The one thing we have to remember is that our food system is a capitalist food system. Now, this might sound obvious, but no one likes to say it. But it is. It's a capitalist food system. And it happens to be failing us. But the good news is, we know a lot about capitalism. Well, some of us do. We've been studying it. In fact, we've been studying it for several hundred years. <clears throat> and capitalism always goes through two phases. It goes through a period of liberalization and a period of reform. So during the period of liberalization, everything is privatized. All regulation is taken off the market. And you get a tremendous concentration of wealth and tremendous inequality, and tremendous social and environmental problems. And then you usually get a big crash. Think about the Roaring Twenties, the 1929 crash. After that comes a period of reform, where the market is regulated, workers are protected, wages are regulated, Production is regulated, so you don't get overproduction. Roosevelt introduced these reforms through the New Deal. He started with agriculture. But Roosevelt would not have been able to introduce these reforms, even though it's a logical thing to do if you want to preserve capitalism, had it not been that there was a strong counter-movement. People took to the streets. Labor unions were strong. Neighborhood organizations were strong. The women's movement was strong. And they allowed Roosevelt, they, they created the social power on the ground which allowed Roosevelt to institute the reforms. So the reforms don't come about just through the goodwill of reformists, they come about through people power, through powerful social movements. So the good news is, history is on our side. Why? Because we've gone through this period of liberalization, which we call globalization, which I've just talked about in terms of the construction of this food, present food regime. We've had the big crash, right? Oh, the other thing you need is a big threat. So the threat back in the 30s was communism. So the big corporations allow Roosevelt to institute these reforms because at that time, socialism and communism looked pretty good to a lot of people. And they were afraid that this government would fall. They were afraid capitalism was going to fall. So what's our big threat today? I'd say it's climate change, which is driven in large part by our food system, the, model, the industrial model of our food system. So what's missing? What's missing is the power of the social movement. And the one place I see the social movement growing is the food movement. And the strongest pillar in the food movement is the food justice movement. I'm going to skip over this one because we're running out of time. And I think I've already said enough. 
Okay, so how do we build these alliances? How do we do food justice? We have to focus on controlling the market, control exchange. And I know that we've started with the farmers markets and the CSAs. We can't stop there because we have to change the rules as well. The rules and the institutions that are working against us in favor of the larger corporations. We need redistributive land justice in this country. It's going the wrong way. Land is concentrated. We need to put the land back into the hands of those who've had the land taken away historically. And I'll just say, African-American farmers in this country, following Reconstruction, were able, without any help at all from the government, certainly not from Andrew Jackson, over time, to acquire 15 million acres of land. Now, as a result of the crises, which I've just laid out, they began to lose that land. In the 1970s, with the farm crisis, where we lost half our farmers, who lost their land first? It was African Americans. And if the white farmers had stood up at the time and said, wait a minute, we can't let this happen, we might not have had a farm crisis. But they didn't. And they paid, because they lost their farms too. So this is why building powerful alliances is so important for white people as well as for people of color. We absolutely have to stop oppression, but to do that, we have to heal the trauma. I, we can't back away from this. Why haven't we come together? Because it hurts. Because we don't trust each other. Sometimes because we don't trust ourselves. Racism is traumatic. It's traumatic, it's mostly traumatic for people of color, but it's also traumatic for white people. We lose our humanity with racism. We lose our humanity with white privilege. We get shackled with fear and with shame and with guilt. Well, you can't be a powerful ally if you're carrying around this baggage of, sheer, of, of fear, shame, and guilt. So we have to deal with the emotional aspects of our white privilege. We have to work through it. And we can't ask people of color to help us do that. We have to do that. I'm talking to all the white folks out here. We have to do that on ourselves. That's our job. They got all kinds of jobs to do. That's our job. Otherwise, we can't be good allies. So that means work, looking at white privilege, not just in the food system, not just in the food movement, but in our organizations and in ourselves. The movement for Black Lives Matter and Food Chain Workers Alliance and the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, there's a movement called Brand Workers in, in New York, about 3,000 of them. They talk about transformational solidarity. That we need to come together in order to transform this food system. Because we don't want to reform it back to something it was in the 60s. Because it was still oppressive then. We need to, in a sense, we need to liberate our food system. For that, we need transformational solidarity. We need a vision. And we have to overcome the historical trauma of racism and genocide and dispossession. And the good news is, we know how to do this. There's folks out there who know how to do this. They may not be working with our food justice movements, but there's been a lot of work done on this. There are resources. We just have to bring them in. This sacred path for overcoming historical trauma comes from indigenous communities in this country who have been devastated in the wake, in, in the years following the genocide. We're devastated by alcoholism and violence and drug addiction they know they can't get through it until they deal with the trauma, or they'll keep falling back into those patterns of addiction. So to bring us together on this, I, I'd like to suggest that we need to build a transformative vision. And so I'd like to end just by asking us to imagine 
what things would look like. What would our food system look like if food workers were food secure? What would our food system look like if farm workers received decent wages, living wages and decent living conditions, no matter their immigration status? What would it look like if women were recognized as the ones who produce our food? And what would our food system look like if Black Lives Matter? Thank you very much. So I guess now we get to talk. <laughs> Comments, questions. I'm learning as I go along. I make mistakes. Don't be afraid to point them out to me. Sir? I'm curious where you see the, the in this kind of whole paradigm that you're, 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 uh, I'm just going to change it up here. You're talking about where do governments themselves uh, arise? Or do you see governments and corporations as pretty much the same? No, that was a slide I skipped. <laughs> <laughs> First question. <laughs> um, So this looks kind of complicated, but actually we've been through most of it. So we know what the corporate food regime is, and we know that it's made up of neoliberal and reformist tendencies. Right now the neoliberals are strong, the reformists are weak. We're in a period of neoliberalization, globalization. Right? Um, the neoliberals talk about food enterprise, everything has to be done through the market. The reformists believe in the same thing, but they believe in safety nets for the poor food security. So that's where we see our government and the institutions around the world. This is part of the food regime. So the World Trade Organization is a global institution. Actually, USAID is a global institution. USDA is actually a global institution. The uh, Farm Bill is a rule, but it's a rule for the world. I mean, the Farm Bill sets the price of food around the world influences the price of land and around the world. Um, so we have these two tendencies, right? And these guys are really strong. They're privatizing everything. They're destroying our public sphere. Um, and these guys are almost powerless to do anything about it. If you think about President Obama, what he wanted to do, what he said he wanted to do when he first came in, and then how much he was actually able to do, you realize how how little power reformists have in this country, even when they get into the White House. Why? Because there wasn't a strong enough social movement there to force the reforms. Um, in the food movements around the world, we see a real progressive wing. That's us. Food justice movement. You guys are doing it. You're producing the food, you're solving the problems in the neighborhoods, training people, setting up markets, local markets and whatnot. But you're not changing the rules. You're not changing the, the global institutions. So when we look at a much more radical side of the movement, it's the food sovereignty movement. They want to democratize the food system. They want food out of the WTO. They want to redistribute land around the world back to the, the peasantry, changing the, changing the rules and the structures. Right? So what I think is that if we need a strong food movement to transform this food regime, then this food justice movement is pivotal. I think that you are globally pivotal. I know it might not feel that way when you're out in the garden working on you know, weeding, but you are. Because if you ally yourself with, and I'm talking not strategy, I'm talking if you strategically ally yourself with the reformists, and they'll give you the money, and they'll bring you in, and they'll co-opt you. Um, then I think you split the food movement down the middle. And I don't think we have a powerful enough, move, powerful enough movement to bring about change here. Now, I don't care about tactical alliances. That's a different thing. That's more superficial. But if you form strategic alliances 
with the food sovereignty movement, with those who are trying to change the rules and change the institutions, as well as the practices and the relationships, then I think we have a powerful movement which can actually allow these reformists to introduce some reforms. And then the question is, what kind of reforms? Reforms to take us back or reforms to take us forward? Transformative reforms. So I think we're at a pivotal moment in history, a critical moment in history, you know, because of climate change and a lot of other things, where this food justice movement is going to determine a lot of where the food movement in general goes and how much power the food movement is going to have on government and all the other institutions that control our food system. So I'm not saying don't be in government. I'm not saying you know, not work with these institutions. So, you know, some of these institutions are split, like the, like the um, Secretary of Agriculture. I mean, Vilsack is a hardcore neoliberal. When Mirigan was subsecretary, assistant secretary, she was really a reformist. She tried to do a lot of good things for us. But she didn't have any power, and that's why she's gone. So the institution itself can be split, and these are just political categories. It doesn't, they're not silos. Thank you so much. That was um, really great. It, we've been learning a lot of the stuff for many years for a lot of us, and it's nice to see it laid out and connect the dots quite the way that you did. Um, I wonder if you think that there is a sort of privatization of the public sphere that serves as a distraction for getting more people involved. So like you mentioned, um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, on the surface, they focus on women farmers. And on the surface, they focus on trying to improve the food system, but it's done through like the technological angle and through microcredit and things like that. Um, and I just wonder if, if efforts like that, which are very visible, serve as a distraction to others who might otherwise get involved and um, maybe confuse our ideas about what is community and participation versus what it, it might otherwise look like in those forms? Most of those efforts attempt to bring people into global markets. And the thing about global markets is the people who do best in the global market are the ones who have the most market power, and those are the monopolies. So that's why the peasantry historically and small family farmers in this country historically we're always very careful about dealing with the market. They don't want to extend themselves too far into the market because if the price goes down and you're all and you everything you've got is in the market, then you lose your farm. So they're always very careful to you know keep some of the production back, keep produ the production in the community, um, and keep a lot of the relations of production in the commons. Right? So. The commons is incredibly important to keeping communities resilient, keeping them together. As we lose the commons, we lose our resilience, and we right when we need it the most. Because with these tremendous market fluctuations, we've got climate change, we've got a rise in violence, the commons is the public sphere. And so I would say whenever any of these projects come in and offer funding or whatever. I think we have to act, don't dismiss them out of hand because you know we do need markets. But we also also have to ask, does this divide us or does it help bring us together? Does it destroy our public sphere or does it help us build a commons? Can we change it so that we are actually building a commons? Um, and because if we're not, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure. Because the steady march of consolidation of capital through history just simply means that once you are brought into the market um, and if you become too dependent on it, then you either do have to get big or they'll get you out.
because um, a part of, of what we do is really working on social determinants of health and trying to fight those systems um, as best that we can. And, you know, talking about white privilege and what we represent is sort of been weighing on my mind a lot recently. So while the questions before me have been like really big and I hear you loud and clear. No, I think we hear you loud and clear. And thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think that is, that's the question we do have to ask ourselves. So first I would say that we have to believe that we can be good allies with folks of color to dismantle racism. Um, and I'm sure you're absolutely committed to that because we, we had a conversation earlier. We have to know, we have to recognize that there is a history of powerful allyship between white folks and black folks. And there is a history of white folks supporting black leadership, cultivating black leadership. And we have to learn that history. I'm learning it myself. I mean, and not just black folks, I mean all people with all people of color. And so, um, for, I mean, just for example, um, the Underground Railroad, Railroad was a collaboration between abolitionists and black folks. And black folks led the Underground Railroad. And white folks figured out how to support them. And they made it work. And I'm sure it was messy, and I'm sure people got pissed off, and I'm sure, you know, all kinds of feelings were hurt. <laughs> but the point was to get people free. Yeah. So we can do it. We know we can do it. And the other thing is, um, as people of privilege, with white privilege, we have to lean very hard on other white folks, especially those who have more privilege than we do. So we were talking earlier about, you know, what's the problem in the gardens and, and on the farms and, and um, well, part of it is, you know, we don't know how to work together. Part of it, some people have privilege, don't know what to use it, don't realize they're using it, stepping on toes, all kinds of stuff happens. So how are we going to work on dismantling racism in our garden? How are we going to do that? Well, we've got to bring some folks in to help us do it. Okay, that's going to cost some money. We don't have any money. We have to make sure that the foundations that are funding this work realize that this is the work. This isn't extra. This isn't some kind of luxury. This isn't something to do just to make us feel good. No, we can't continue until we do this. So this is the work. You want food security? You want gardens? You want CSAs? You want all these things? Then we have to do this work and you have to support us. And we have to speak in, with one voice. And I, I'm convinced that not all of these foundations, but a significant number of them are going to listen. Or we're going to embarrass them into listening. Because no one can be against this. Especially not after the last year, last six months. I mean, after Ferguson, after Sandy Hook, after everything, if this isn't the first item on the agenda, I don't know what is. And the food movement represents a unique space to work on this. It's probably the safest space, one of the safest spaces we've got to work on this. It would be irresponsible not to do. Bobby. I, I just want to kind of add to a possible answer. 
One is that as past president of the American Community Garden Association and understanding its mission in terms of what it was founded upon and being able to crisscross this country and talk to different groups and being in the urban agricultural in metro Atlanta urban for 20 plus years. We have to understand that community gardening, and, and, and I always tell folks this, it has two phases to it. One is growing healthy food, and one is growing healthy communities. And it becomes important that you make an effort to empower the people in the community, to give them tools necessary to overcome the objectives to overcome the obstacles and stumbling blocks that's gonna be in their pathway so that they can handle their own situation. Because at some point in time, those influential people is gonna disperse out of the community. And then you're gonna leave people in the same shape that they were already in. So it becomes important that you build stronger and healthy communities and gardening is just one of those tools to help you do that. All right, um, is there any other? Okay, well, let, me, let me call on this uh, lady here and then we'll get back to you. Um, so this is getting at what you, you started to talk about, but in, in Atlanta, in the local food scene, what I see racism being perpetuated through is the distribution of resources and how we, and when I say resources, I mean grant money, I mean funding, but I also mean social resources. I mean, who gets the attention, who gets the partners, with the green people that promote you well, that allow your business, your farm, your organization to move up in the world. Um, so my question is, how do we advocate for communities of color? How do we advocate for organizations run by communities of color? in order to get an equal distribution of resources. By doing it. <laughs> By being an advocate. Yeah. By taking a strong position and insisting on that. By stepping back when you have to step back, when the resources are coming, and make sure that they go to the folks who aren't getting them. I mean, I think that, you know, those of us with white privilege have more power than we think. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can really look up the food chain and, and make some demands based on what seem to me to be some pretty clear, not just moral arguments, but rational arguments. This can't continue. Things are getting worse. It can't continue. And I think we have to appeal to people's intelligence and to their better angels to do the right thing. So we have to become powerful advocates. And um, obviously that means we have to have strong relationships with our, our allies, with people of color. We have to know what we're supposed to be advocating for. And we can't do that unless we don't have a good relationship. And so it's building those relationships. When you say building strong communities, it's all strong communities are based on strong relationships, too. That's part of the, the glue I'm talking about, the, the public sphere. We get to rebuild that public sphere in a more equitable way. And that makes sure that within our commons, within our public sphere, it's going to be the rules of liberation. It's not going to be the rules from the outside. Because the rules from the outside are racist. And we can't continue them. I'm losing track here. Gene. Um, there was one that we have to talk. Well, I just want to kind of bounce off what uh, Rodney was talking about um, with the idea of community. Uh, first of all, it seems like uh, once that community is built, it's usually on the foundation of um, what is maybe a blighted, quote unquote, an area that property value is raised and then it's taken. And so, you know, it, it seems like uh, there should be some kind of initial. Um, objective and actual ownership of that, that blight of land, whether it's cancer or however something happens to that, so you know it's not taken away. Um, uh, so you have that kind of foundation um, uh, made for perpetuity. 
I don't know, but yeah. uh, yeah. at some point where it can continue to build as new new people get into the community. Um, I would just like, if I may, Eric, to, to also offer a little something to you too. Uh, what I one of the interesting things for me, I, I, I was born in Southern California and I was raised in a very diverse neighborhood and so I was in and out of a lot of different households and kind of like a common thread for I think many African Americans is to understand how different households run culturally, right? So what I've seen in most of the households of my friends that were white folks was they could go in their house and if they got mad they could yell at their folks and they could do all kinds, throw all kinds of temper tantrums and all that kind of stuff. And I couldn't do that in my house, and a lot of the friends of mine couldn't do that in their house, but I would see that behavior. And I would say that if you are a young white person in the food movement who has a paid gig, throw a temper tantrum. <laughs> <laughs> because it is part of your, is what I have seen, it is part of the cultural fabric of how y'all get down. <laughs> and you know, you're already paid, like what the, you know, most of us, I think Eric made a really good point by saying there's some work that y'all have to do. We got, Mr. Wilson has been doing this work for so long, you know? And for you, I, I've seen so many young folks since I've been here in Atlanta, the only the eight years that I've been here, who've been able to step in and then find a paid job. So you can go in there and you can really, in in because it's all pretty monolithic in there anyway, and show yourself culturally and say, hey, no, 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 this is ridiculous, and cry, and do all the things that you need to do. <laughs> and throw a temper tantrum because you are on staff. And the other thing is more uh, strategic is if there's other people on staff that believe the same thing, feel the same way, and you all are paid to be there, there's nothing stopping you from taking 3% of your income and setting up a fund. You get paid every week to, to supposedly advocate for us. So put 3% of your money away into a bank account. And then at the end of that six months or the end of the year, you've already formed allies with other organizations of color and people of color that have been doing the work. Y'all get together and administer your own grants. And when people in your organization see that you took your own paycheck and you took, you mean you and Hillary and Sarah got together and took 3% of your own paycheck, that's not gonna kill you. And then you put it together in a fund and you invested it and then in a year it turned around and you walk over to Metro Atlanta Urban Farms and you come to grow where you are and go, we're doing this, not on behalf of Georgia Organic, not on behalf of Emory, but on behalf of these three people who took it upon ourselves to do that. And we're gonna not take applications because food well applications come out at the wrong time and they take too long for you to get the money, but we're just gonna say, hey, you've seen your work already. You ain't gotta prove nothing to us. This is what we can do. No, we can't give you 60 grand, but we can give you 500. Do it, do with it as you see fit, because we trust and believe that you know how to handle your own business. The other piece is, uh, as a question to you, what do you see is the motivation for the funders, either in why they do it or why they're not doing it? Are they being pulled underneath the table for some particular reason? <clears throat> Or is it just lack of awareness and information? So the way foundations work is that, a family foundation, there's different kinds, but family foundations are one that mostly support the food work. Um, so you've got a, a board, of, you've got a, a board of trustees, either made up of mostly or all family members from some corporation, of, some empire. So whether it's um, Hewlett Packard or you know Swift or you know they they, they made their money in, in some product or some industry, and then they make the foundation and they're living off the the, uh, the wealth from that, or the the, the uh, foundation is living off the wealth from the original profits. So those are the ones that then tell the. The executive directors and the executive directors then tells the project directors and the program directors what they're going to fund. And so when you talk to a project director or a program director, 
about funding this or that, or you turn in a proposal to them or, or whatever, there's, a, there's very limited uh, flexibility of what they can fund. And the other problem is, so what, so what to do about it? The other problem is, these the, as the government has been whittled away, and we've lost our health, education, and welfare services that we used to get through the government, they've been privatized. These foundations, I think for the most part with the best of intentions, have come in and tried to substitute for the government tried to provide those services on the basis of grants and funding community organizations. The problem is that there's never going to be enough grant money to do all that work. And then the other problem is they started too many NGOs and they can't fund them all now. There's way too many. So they have us all competing with each other. Um, and it's like there's a big marketplace of project proposals, you know, like they went to a farmer's market of project proposals and they walk out and, okay, I'll have a dozen of these and a few of those and a few of those and they fill up their basket and those are the ones they're going to fund. And they come back the next week and it's a different set, you know, so they can't build, we're not building partnerships anymore. We're used to, we're not doing it anymore, but now the, the whole structure has changed. So. How to get around that, I think you just provided a very good example because what has to happen is something I saw happen in when I was living in Nicaragua during the revolution, which is the, the, um, the community groups themselves have to have a plan of development. And then you present that development plan to the funders and say, you know, we all got together and we decided this is how we wanted to do things. This is how we wanted to develop our own food system. So if you want to help us, this is how you can do it. Now, they're not going to accept that right off. So you, and you can't take it to the program director. Because, you know, I mean, they might help advocate for you, but they can't do anything. It has to get to the trustees. The trustees have to see that that the way they're helping right now is actually causing a lot of problems. And, um, and they don't want to be causing problems. You know, we want to believe in, in, in their goodwill and that they can be doing things in a better way. In Nicaragua, what happened was the, the government at the time, the revolutionary government, which was distributing land and doing all kinds of things, there, were, there weren't any NGOs. There was a farmer's organization, there was a women's organization, a worker's organization. There were about five or six organizations in the whole country. A small <coughs> business organization. And then all these foundations came and, and um, wanted, to, wanted to support the revolution. They're mostly European foundations. And they wanted to start NGOs. And the government said, no, 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 no. You're not doing that here. You want to support something? You support one of these mass organizations. And they said, you all get your act together. Coordinate yourselves so you're not, um, you know, double funding one organization and not funding the other. Figure out who's going to fund farming, who's going to fund women, who's going to fund, you know, like that. And um, it was really powerful. I was in a room <laughs> at the farmers organization when the head of Ford Foundation walked in and said, uh, okay, so, you know, we want to fund you. And they said, great, we've got this project. We want to set up little co-op stores with farm supplies all through the country and these areas which are really remote so that farmers, and want to subsidize it so that farmers can buy rubber boots, machetes, seeds, really the basics, you know. So you can fund that. It's like a $5 million project. You know, we got the Swedes are helping us with a couple million, the Germans are helping us here, you know. And the guy from Ford said, no, no, we, we like to start different, you know, we want to start with maybe a small grant, maybe $20,000, $50,000, and we would like you to actually do a, a research project and let us know, you know, what your farmers are producing. That's a shock. That's like, <laughs> you know, the Hoover is like, and I was embarrassed because I'd actually facilitated this visit from the guy from the Ford Foundation. And um, 
And the farmers just said, you know, basically, you know, thanks, but we think you're too small for us. <laughs> and the guy couldn't believe it. No one had ever turned down anything from the Fork Foundation. I mean, this was a guy who, who thought all of his jokes were funny. And, um, because everybody would laugh, you know? And all of a sudden, you know, no one's laughing. And it was because they had a plan. They had a plan, but they had power too. So I think that, that it's not gonna be easy, but I think that we have to start by saying we actually know what we wanna do. But to do that, we have to come together and decide what it, what it is we wanna do. And, um, and I also know that's not easy because we've been trying to do it in Oakland for four years now because the, organ because the foundations have us coming and going and fighting amongst each other over the crumbs. And that's the worst part. We're, we're being divided rather than coming together. So, you know, we've had a couple of uh, big meetings with, you know, 40, 50 community organizations just to say, okay, come on, really, how can we get together? And we're, on, we're trying, we're on the road. I know it's not easy, it's gonna be a process. And the other is, I think just, um, I think organizations like Food First, actually, because we do a lot of writing and publishing, and those guys read our stuff. Um, we need to amplify your voices so they can hear what it is you really want to do. See, right now what's happening is they're looking at your performance. Oh, aren't you great you did a garden? Oh, aren't you great you did a CSA? But they don't see your vision. They don't see your strategy. They don't see your, your strategic plan. Well, for that, we need a vision and we need a strategic plan. Um, otherwise, I, you know, I don't think that, was it, the, the revolution will not be televised, the revolution will not be funded. Can I, um, I translate what you just said is into, um, they want to see it as being sustainable instead of having to keep giving money to um, the startups. Is that, is, that, is that what you're kind of saying? They want to see, like, like when you ask what, what's the uh, food sister? They want to see a lot of things. And so then they measure what you're doing. They measure your performance. And, you know, it's not a bad thing to measure performance. It's like an evaluation. You figure out where you're going. But what I'm saying is, how about instead of looking at your performance, they looked at your vision. What are you trying to accomplish? And then they said, we're going to help you accomplish that. And for that, you have to tell them what the vision is. Because they, they don't know. They're inventing things over there. They bring in consultants to figure out, you know, what's the best thing for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Eric, I just want to make a, a, a comment. Is, is, is that as you crisscross the country and talking at various universities, just an idea is that maybe we encourage some of these students to write mm. and we find a place for them in some of our publication and on our website to kind of focus in on their vision and see how these visions might contrast from various universities from the north to the south mm. and, and give them a tool or instrument so that their vision can be expanded out into the world. Well, it's, your timing's perfect, Bobby, because um, as you know, we're hiring this young woman named Breeze Harper. She's a African-American researcher. She re does uh, critical race theory and she works in the community. And um, we want to have a a project at Food First, which is focused specifically on dismantling racism at the food system, and it cuts across all of our programs and projects. And that's, this, what you're suggesting, is exactly what we can do with that, um, with that program. Uh, she, I mean, she's coming on board in April. And I, I just want to give a shout out to my board of directors, because we've been asking the foundations for money for this for a long time, and they haven't given us any love. And so finally, I asked the board of directors if they would contribute. If they would contribute money from their pocket, or if they would raise the money 
on their own, because there's 14 of us on the board of directors, to be able to fund this position. And if they funded half, I'd find a way, some way to fund the other half. And they said yes. And so we're just going to do it. And yes, I invite every, every one of you to be a contributor to a series of publications which would try to advance this vision, what you need and how are we going to dismantle racism and what you need to dismantle racism in the food movement and in the food system. Um, yeah, we'll do that. We'll absolutely do that. So write to us, write to me. And another thing that they can do, they, they also can send your five and ten dollars to Food Earth to say, help to support the movement. And then when you get the big job, send the big check. Mm. <laughs> so how come I can talk like this? <laughs> it's because um, we don't get any money from the foundations. Mm. We get money from people like you. We have five thousand uh, members. And they give anywhere from five dollars a month. I mean, from five dollars a year to five thousand dollars a year. And they expect us to be independent, to do independent research, speak our mind. And um, I invite all of you to be members of Food First, mm -hmm. even if you got just five bucks. A lot of times, I'll get five bucks in the mail with a big long letter. <laughs> telling me what I should do and or what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong and whatnot. And then, you know, $5,000 comes, wow, who's that? Let me call. No, they don't want you to call. <laughs> oh, one thing we do that I, I, want, I want to share is we take these food sovereignty tours. We go around the world. We take groups around the world. We go to Bolivia, Cuba, um, the Basque Country, Italy. South Korea, Mexico, and Hawaii. And um, these tours, they're a little pricey. They're not as pricey as most tours. As far as tours go, they're on the cheap end. It's about a 10-day tour. You get great food, and you meet with farmers and social movements who are changing the food system. It's a really good way to exchange information, make friends and whatnot. This one's in Hawaii. Like at the, in South Korea, it's the women, the women farmers movement hosts us. In the Basque country, it's the Basque farmers movement. You know, so it's usually with farmers movement, you stay in farmers' houses. Um, they're great tours. Really good groups get together to go on these tours. And we're doing food justice tours in the US. So we bring people to the Bay Area and show them the Bay Area. What I would really like to do is to take young people from the Bay Area and bring them out here. And then bring young people from here and take them to the Bay Area. I just came back from New York, and they want to do that. They want to get kids from the boroughs together, come out. To, now, those things, they can't, of course, the kids can't afford any of that. Um, but we've got to find a way. Because there, you're not just learning. They're also going to be establishing a network of young leaders right, um, who are going to build this food movement. There are scholarships for these tours. We always make sure that about a third of the people on these tours are farmers, either urban or rural, and there are scholarships for you. And there are scholarships for people of color. Not too many, because what we do is we charge the people who can pay a little bit extra so that we can have two or three scholarships. And, um, and we hit up some, some wealthy friends of ours to, to start a fund for scholarships. And I really recommend these tours. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see some of you folks on them. And um, maybe with Bobby, we can organize something between the West Coast and, and, uh, and Atlanta, too. Thanks so much. I really